What does it mean to listen? Um, I am basing this uh, field work, this uh, presentation on field work that I've done with Studio Mateka, there's a theatre studio in Wrocław in Poland, and I've been working with them since October 2010, so that's about a year and a half, really. Um, and uh, though this question might seem like a pretty banal thing, it's for them a matter of metaf what I call metaphysics in practice, because the words can evoke meaning, but they don't necessarily mean all that they s try to signify, and they don't signify all that they mean. So in trying to define undefinable t things, they are um, setting like this notion of performer self and becoming performer in motion, because this theatre group is basically working on becoming performer, um, which is, in my argument, based on creating a framework within which this performer self can come into being, uh, working towards something that you will never fully reach and um, what I will call defined in definitions, which are concepts that have a sort of tactile group consensus, but no formal definition, are what sort of, they have an effect on the world that reach beyond linguistics, it reaches beyond performances or speech acts, but it's crucial for them to construct the body as the instrument for which they work as a basis. Um, and so, to make sense of their studio practice and whilst taking them seriously, I found it really important to focus not just on sort of phenomenology, which sort of collapses everything into representations, not just focusing on their body technique, <coughs> but also not just focusing on Borio's structure and structures and habitus, but rather going beyond them so that just like the body has to be trained and conditioned, actually they also have to learn and embody the meaning of concepts such as listening, honesty, truth, and all of these then make them objective and observable within what they do in their context. Um, I therefore view this through the lens of apprenticeship as a mode of becoming performer, where they embody a set of techniques and understandings that enable the performer self to come into being. Um, so for Mo Melo Ponti, uh, who's sort of the father of phenomenology, according to some, uh, if we consider the body is a vehicle for being in the world. So if we consider the studio as <coughs> a cosmos in its own right, then the performer self becomes a performer through actually performing the journey. And if we quote Victor Turner, he says that the reflexive and therapeutic character of theatre, as essentially a child through an aggressive face of social drama, has to draw on power sources, often inhibited or at least constrained in the cultural life of society's indicative mood. The deliberate creation of a detached, still almost sacred liminal space allows a search for such sources. One source of this excessive meta power is clearly the liberated and disciplined body itself, with its many untapped resources for pleasure, pain, or expression. So, as Turner's theatre is a social drama, it's very close to defining exactly what Studio Mateka is. In the studio leader's Mate, Mate's words, the aim of the studio is not to create bodies that are plastic devices in service to the storytelling of the theatre, <coughs> but on the contrary, <coughs> to instill a practice that keeps the physical body a well-cleaned instrument capable of complex, subtle expression. By engaging the entire body-mind, the body becomes a luminous reflection of the inner thoughts and the channel for the self. In other words, it's impossible to just look at the body or just look at body technique because the body-mind implies that the body is both separate from and the same as the self. Um, and this self is essentially in the studio idea. It's something that's inside and has to be brought out. Uh, beyond Morse's definition of the body being our first and most natural instrument, we then have it as a partner that has to be exercised on and worked on. And further following Morse, um, working on body technique, uh, he says also what should be explained is the extent to which all social life depends on these techniques. Um, and as the performers come from a wide range of backgrounds, as you can see from, they have a range of different nationalities, uh, they have to sort of find a common starting point. And like um, following Tim Ingold, who says that, his, that there is a sort of history of development behind everything an organism can do. Uh, you can see that in the studio, they're not starting from scratch, which sort of simplifies the process and makes it a lot more difficult. Um, because it's about a lot more than just ticking boxes or completing a test. It's the process in itself is an end and a means. It's a transformative state of emergence and becoming following Deleuze, and a goal that is reached towards but never reached. So for Tim, 
one performance to join the studio almost a year after the rest. He had gone through the training, but not the initial sort of breakdown process and so like the becomings of this. And so he found it difficult to uh, actually understand how to move within the work. Um, and this sort of highlights how there is a certain sense of habitus, but that the training also has much more in common with craft apprenticeship, which is what I move on to. Um, for you, the LC, you probably know the work of Trevor Markland. <coughs> He defines <coughs> apprenticeship as sort of encoding a moral behavior and a specific way of thinking about the world through a long-term immersion in a learning environment. And this is well suited to the sort of long-term process that the studio is working with. Um, if we then view further, this is a way of instilling a new second nature through mimesis. It's important to keep in mind that um, it's not just sort of a learned um, theory that instills powers, as Bordio would say but it's also about why and the search for the why. And there's um, Gosselin who works with pottery makes in China, and it was the shaping techniques is also a re-evaluation of knowledge and a modification of behavior at the same time. And this shows us how each individual performer are not becoming Mate, but they are becoming more fully their individual selves. And so that taking them seriously depends on that engagement with <coughs> being an individual. And, um, their discourse on freeing the body might sound like sort of a um, Foucauldian determinism, but what I argue is this the studio, the performers have chosen to be part, so it's sort of like it's not a volitional, it's a bit like a volitional regimentation where you choose to undergo these practices in order to become more fully yourself. Um, and the search for truth is essential to the studio. Uh, but this is not really the place to sort of explore this, but uh, Holbrad, Martin Holbrad notes that we have to redefine our concept of truth in order to make sense of the practices of others. So rather than me judging whether or not what they do is true, I want to leave the truth to the side and focus on what it does in parallel to their <coughs> work on body technique that's experienced as meaningful for them and therefore becomes true. Um, so there were two performers that actually left the studio during the work because it did not fit with their sort of notion of truth and essence in relation to what Mate did. So you can see how it's sort of as techniques are gradually mastered and developed, a shared understanding of the studio's ethos and working principles developed. So for those that it didn't work for, they left, whereas the others have formed this sort of community of practice within which the work actually sort of exists. So this leads me to what it actually means to listen, because um, Mate, even though he works on this, like you should work without words, uh, they have a sort of the words are very crucial to understanding what it, what they do in practice. So they have uh, an exercise that's called running in the space, which is fairly crucial for all physical theatre work, where. Um, they literally run, walk, or move in a rehearsal space for a time period of anything between five minutes and an hour. And in this, they sort of um, listen or adjust themselves to each other constantly. And um, <coughs> asking, and like, I could clearly see that they improved in this as they went along. And asking Daniel what it meant means, he would say that <coughs> you, you can't define it. If you define it, you put it in a box, and that's sort of trapping it. And it's sort of okay to do that for academic purposes, but it ruins what you actually try to do, because you're not just listening, quoting with your body, with your, no, with your ears. You're listening with your body, with your eyes, with your smells, all of those real physical senses, and also with your intention and your energy and your heart. So we can see how there's a lot more at stake and a lot more going on. And in trying to make sense of this, I draw on Christopher Bracken's work, uh, who follows Olson's <coughs> theory of speech acts and describes how certain words become almost like a manner force, where they are neither entirely discursive or entirely physical. And this provides us with a way of understanding how the words function. I call this a defined indefinition, because they're key words of their working vocabulary. But they are not defined in a way that you can sort of pin down. You uh, they are sort of defined, boxed away, and just put to work as a sort of something that you develop an individual understanding of. 
but that there is still a clear group consensus of that's never spoken of. You just you think on your feet and you accommodate yourself in relation to the others. And so these things were as, as imprecise guidelines with precise meanings for each individual and form a very fundamental part of their work. Uh, so what I'm suggesting at the end of it is that we start, start, if we start with looking at the body and how it's a tool, it's also a channel for the self and, it's, and a way of relating to others. And beyond any determinism or so sort of oversimplified versions of apprenticeship, the performers are not just flowing down the stream like cultural juice and sort of being <coughs> forged into, forced into this way of seeing the world. They rather sort of make their own choices and they act in accordance to their own beliefs. Almost done. Um, and uh, open up to sort of reformation through the space provided by Mate in the studio. So by analytically sort of displacing thought as something that only works in practice for them, then this creation happens in the gaps between knowledge, as Strathern would say, and to consider these defined the definitions as separate from the practice would actually be to fundamentally ignore how they enable the performer self and this particular language to emerge. In this way, I might not sort of add much to anthropological theory or um, knowledge about the world, but um, I'm trying to make the point that it's enabling their sort of manual metaphysics of working as an apprenticeship process and in, within their framework and cosmos and, and how that both relies on and is separate from language, which is this paradox that we're all working on. <laughs>